this session on effectively communicating climate change risks to health. Part of the uh, Pan American uh, uh, Climate Resilient uh, Health Systems course. This is the last uh, session of the course. So I'm really excited to be moderating today. My name is Peter Berry. I'm with the Climate Change and Innovation Bureau at, uh, at Health Canada. And I know this is gonna be a really interesting and exciting uh, session. Sorry, just having trouble shifting the slide here. So um, you do have access to live interpretation for people joining us for the first uh, session. It's available in English, Spanish, and French. And uh, you just need to use uh, the circle button at the bottom of the uh, screen, the interpretation uh, globe. So I'd invite people to actually do that uh, uh, now while we're getting started. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the last uh, session of this uh, uh, course, session nine. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to our expert uh, speakers uh, today. Um, I think there's really fewer, few greater challenges uh, in the field of climate change and health on communicating uh, health risks uh, from, from climate change. But you know, I think that we'll hear from our expert uh, panelists uh, today that there are really great opportunities to build climate resilient health systems and individuals um, through you know, really collaborative, uh, planned, uh, thoughtful and inclusive communications. So I'm, I'm really, uh, really excited for the, the session today. So just a reminder that uh, for you, uh, for, for those of you that um, are, are looking to get uh, the certificate uh, with this course, the attendance is verified when you're connected, you don't have to fill out a separate form. And just in terms of some uh, logistics, please make sure to mute your uh, microphones. The session will be 90 minutes uh, in length and it'll culminate with a question and answer uh, section. Uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A. It's at the bottom of the Zoom function. The sessions will be recorded and posted on the website within 24 hours. And the uh, slide decks for the main presentations are going to be available for download on that um, uh, on the course website. And I believe we'll be uh, actually posting in the chat the, the link uh, to that for you. So I'm really excited to introduce our expert panelists for today's session. Uh, Dr. Edward uh, Maybeck is a distinguished university professor and director of the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University in the US. His research illuminates public understanding of climate change and strategies for improving it. Ed previously served as associate director at the National Cancer Institute, worldwide director, director of social marketing at Porter Novelli, and chairman of the board for Kids Save International. He is a fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Ed will be presenting on delivering effective messages about climate change and health. We'll also hear from Donna Atkinson and Roberta Stout on communicating about climate change and Indigenous peoples' health in Canada. Donna and Roberta have been working together since 2014 on various projects at the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, including the Climate Change and Indigenous People's Health in Canada report released in 2022. Hailing from Prince George, British Columbia in Canada, Donna holds an undergraduate and graduate degrees in history from the University of Northern British Columbia. Roberta Cree from Kewan First Nation in Alberta completed an undergraduate degree at Carleton University and a graduate degree at Simon Fraser University. Donna and Roberta have both worked in the field of Indigenous health for over 20 years. We will then be joined by Carolina Portalupi Castro, who will make a presentation on challenges of risk management communication for health systems in the context of climate change. Carolina is an economist from Ecuador with postgraduate training in human development and education studies. She's a coordinator of the Master in Public Administration and Professor of Public Policy at Casa Grande University. She also teaches public policies for disaster risk reduction at the Simon Bolivar Indian University. Carolina has training and experience in the field of integrated disaster risk management, risk reduction in education uh, communities, human development, public policy, and economics. And among other activities, 
Carolina was a member of the evaluation team of the effects and impacts of COVID-19 pandemic from December to March 20th in Ecuador and supported the Vice Presidency of the Republic for the implementation of mitigation actions during the pandemic. And I'm really delighted that we'll be, we will be joined by the Minister of Health in New Queen, Argentina, Dr. Andrea Peve, who will discuss with us today the Provincial Health Plan 2019 to 2023, including some climate related actions. Minister Peve graduated as a medical doctor uh, from the University of Buenos Aires with a specialization in pediatrics. She also has a master's in epidemiology and health policies and a PhD in health management from the National University of Lanou. In her professional career within the public health system in Noiken, she led the Remedier Redes project networks with funding from the World Bank and the project Protection of Vulnerable Populations Against Non-Communicable uh, Chronic Diseases, also financed by the World Bank. She also served as a technical coordinator of the United Nations Development Program project in Noiken and as a provincial health director with the Ministry of Health. Since April 2019, she served as Minister of Health for the province of Nuquen, where she has implemented several policies focused on health promotion and on the first level of care. Among them, include the development of the Provincial Health Plan 2019 to 2023 and the subsequent Provincial Health Plan 2023 to 2030. The beginning of the construction of the Norpatagonico Hospital and the creation of the Intercultural Health Centre. Before I turn it over, I do want to acknowledge that I am actually joining today from uh, the land uh, uh, from which I'm making the presentation, Ottawa, Canada. And this is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And the Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. So with that, I will turn it over to Ed for his uh, presentation. Thumbs up on the visuals, Peter? Yep, Excellent. this is great. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour, buenos dias. Um, it is my pleasure to spend some time with you this morning and, and share a few thoughts about how we, as health professionals, can use our trusted, caring voices to convey simple, clear, effective messages to help people understand the human health relevance of global warming. Um, I'd actually like to start by asking you all a question. Please put your, uh, your answer in the chat. Um, and the question, this is a question that I've asked to over 40,000 people over the past uh, dozen or so years in our surveys that we conduct here in the United States. Um, we ask them before we ask people any other questions, we say, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear global warming? So take a moment now and, and share with us your thoughts. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the words global warming? We are not uh, an average audience, an average group of people. We are highly trained health professionals. We've come, we have an unusual insight on the fact that climate change is in fact the world's pre most pressing uh, human health issue. But what we've learned from the public is that the first thing that comes to mind for most Americans uh, is a polar bear. It's not surprising. The polar bear is probably almost certainly the most iconic visual image that's used in the media to represent global warming. Um, and as a result of seeing not necessarily this photo, but of, of one of dozens of different photos of polar bears often looking much less robust than this, this lovely uh, fellow. Um, it has come to represent sort of our the center of our mental model, how we think about global warming, a threat to polar bears. Another reference that we hear very frequently in response to that open ended question has to do with science, whether it's a representation of the Keeling curve like this data here or some other uh, essentially reference to scientists or science. Um, that's, uh, that's the second most common thing that we hear, which is like polar bears, it's interesting, but it's not necessarily perceived to be personally relevant by people. So when they tell us about polar bears, when they tell us about the Keeling curve or science, 
Um, it means they're paying attention, but they're only paying attention to a fairly narrow representation of what global warming really uh, is all about in our world today. The third most common reference we hear is reference to politics or politicians. You may or may not recognize uh, that this is Al Gore, former US vice president, who has campaigned relentlessly over the past 25 or 30 years to try to wake up um, our, our fellow citizens here in the United States to the realities of global warming. For Democrats or liberals, when they talk about, when they mention Al Gore as top of mind, the first thing they think of, that's a good thing. When our conservative brothers and sisters mention Al Gore as the first thing that comes to mind, that isn't a good thing. They don't like him, they don't trust him, and when they say he's the first thing that comes to mind, it's a real clear sign that we have a lot of work to do to help them understand the personal relevance of climate change. Increasingly, we, we actually started asking this question as early as 2008, so that's 15 years ago now. Um, 15 years ago, we heard very little references to extreme weather events. Um, with increasing frequency now, we do hear about extreme weather events. Part of that is as a result of the work that my team does with TV weathercasters, broadcast meteorologists here in North America. Um, we are supporting them as trusted local voices in their community to educate people about how climate change is already changing conditions in their community, in their city. And we are seeing the evidence of that in people's open-ended responses. But even now that this is becoming an increasing top of mind response, it's still very much in the minority. We're much more likely to hear about plants, penguins, and polar bears, about, um, about science and about politicians. What we almost never hear in this, in response to that open-ended question is any reference to health, the health of our children, our own health, the health of our other family members, the health of our community members, or even the health of people in our nation. And this represents a huge opportunity for us as, as trusted, uh, trusted messengers in our communities and in our nation, because what we have, the information that we know, the information that you're learning in this course and elsewhere, our research has shown, and I'll cover this in a minute, our research has shown that this is the most personally engaging narrative, the most personally engaging information that can be shared um, if we want people to understand the personal relevance of global warming to them, if we want people to, uh, to become more concerned about the situation and more likely to participate in, uh, in directly implementing solutions or working together with members of their community to implement community-wide solutions. My specialty in the field of public health, I've, I've been in the field of public health for 42 years now. My specialty is as a communication scientist working on public health issues. In the time that I have been working, the one thing that I have learned with greater certainty than anything else is that there really is a formula for effective public health communication campaigns. Every public health communication campaign, every successful public health communication campaign that I've been privy to has always comported to this formula. It has simple, clear messages. It succeeds in getting those messages repeated often. And the messages are brought to the public, whether that's the general public or more, or more specific audiences within the public, including policymakers. Um, those messages, those simple, clear messages, repeated often, must be delivered by a variety of trusted and caring voices. The simple, clear message part is so crucial because people don't deal well with complexity. When we share complex information with the public, they tend to tune us out. The message repetition portion is so important because it takes people many exposures to begin to think about the information that we're presenting to them. I'll show you more about that in a moment. And the fact that the information comes from trusted and caring voices is perhaps the most important element of this formula because when 
members of our audience do not trust us or do not trust the messengers, the carriers of the information that we are trying to share, they, they engage a, a variety of psychological processes to keep that information at bay. Most simply, they begin to they either dismiss it or they begin to counter argue with it, as opposed to consider it and incorporate it into their own understanding of the world. Our research with folks here in the United States has shown that there are essentially what I call six key facts or six key truths about global warming that are strongly determinative, strongly influential on determining the degree to which people uh, are concerned about climate change and, the, and their likelihood of getting involved in taking actions to address it. Those six key facts are understanding that it's real, that global warming is happening, that it's us, that human activity is the main cause of global warming, that the experts agree. On my slide, I say more than 97% of the world's climate experts are convinced based on data that human activity is warming the planet. In reality, it's probably more like 99.9%, .9%, but I'm going with a very conservative estimate um, that it's bad that global warming has harmful consequences, as I'll share with you in a moment, when people understand the harmful human health consequences, it's particularly engaging. That there's hope, that there are act people have to understand there are actions we can take that will make a difference. Our, our brothers and sisters who are concerned about it, but have concluded there's nothing we can do. The horse has left the barn. We can't get the horse back those people tend not to be taking action because they're left in a state of hopelessness. And then finally, the sixth key truth is the belief that other people care, like us. Seven out of 10 people here in the United States are worried about global warming. Many fewer than half, let's say about four out of 10, believe that other people have reached the same conclusion and are also worried. So while most folks here in the United States are worried about climate change, um, many of them, about half of them, think that they are in the minority. Uh, social norms researchers will tell you believing that you are in the minority is not a helpful state of being um, because we tend to self-censor. We tend to internalize our concerns rather than externalize them by taking action. So these are the six key truths that we know are strongly associated with people rolling up their sleeves and getting involved to advocate for or to directly implement climate solutions. I would contend to you that these are six simple, clear messages. It's real, it's us, experts agree, it's bad, there's hope and, and you're not alone, other people care. To the extent that we can put our trusted and caring voices behind some version of this, this, these six key truths, we as health professionals will be helping bring members of our community, members of our nation and, and our brothers and sisters around the world into a greater state of readiness to participate in climate solutions. Which takes me to the second part, the second of the three parts of that formula, simple, clear messages repeated often. I cannot, Oh, overemphasize enough how important message repetition is. I'm showing you data from a, a research and communication team headquartered in New York called Potential Energy. They are a relatively new group. They're mostly using um, social media and other forms of web-based communication to try to get um, folks here in the United States involved in advocating for climate action. And what their research shows is incredibly revealing about the full extent of how important message repetition is. Their research, uh, based on their research, they are estimating that the optimal frequency of people hearing about climate change in order to get them involved as an active supporter for significant climate actions is 80 or more times per month. That's 20 or more times per week. If that sounds absurd to you, let me put it in context. Where whichever country you are currently residing in, there are all kinds of issues in the news today 
where people are hearing about it more than 20 times per week. Climate change isn't one of them. We need to work much harder to get climate change in the news or into the public dialogue or into person-to-person -person communication because the more times people hear about it in a given week or a given month, the more likely they are to become an active supporter of significant climate action. Which brings me to the third and final component of, the, uh, of that formula, the fact that um, messages are most effective when delivered by a variety of trusted and caring voices. And which brings me to us. We, health professionals, are those trusted and caring voices. This is data from last year, 2022. Ipsos is a global polling firm. I don't actually remember the number of countries in this firm, uh, in, in this particular poll. Oh, there it is at the bottom of the slide. This is from 28 countries in all, on all continents and doctors come up as number one. Sometimes they also ask about nurses and pharmacists and other health professionals. We always come up at the top of the most trusted category of professionals. It's an incredible um, position in our, in our societies for us to occupy. It's absolutely wonderful. It is a position of privilege. And because we have earned that position of privilege, it has created opportunities for us to be those trusted and caring voices to make sure that members of our population have all of the relevant information they need to, uh, to appropriately understand the biggest risk to their own health, to the health of their family, to the health of their fellow citizens. Um, which is, of, in my view, climate change. This is data from my, uh, my, my colleagues at Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and my colleagues here at George Mason. We, uh, uh, the, we conduct that climate change in the American mind that I led with, that open-ended question. This is data from our spring 2022 survey. We ask our respondents, how much do you trust or distrust each of the following as a source of information about global warming? We've analyzed the data by where people fall on the political continuum, because here in the United States, climate change is a highly polarized issue. And the polarizing factor is people's political identity or their political affiliation. So what I'm showing you here is not only on the left-hand side of the slide, how all registered voters in America, who they trust, and you can see they trust their primary care doctor as, as in the number four position. They trust NASA and the most trusted position, friends and family and climate scientists, but their primary care doctor is their next most trusted. And if you go down the list, you can see in blue that the, they trust the American Medical Association quite a lot as well. Now move your eyes across the slide to the right-hand column, and you can see that among um, my, my conservative, uh, my strongly conservative bro brothers and sisters here in the United States, a very difficult audience to communicate about climate change with, they actually trust us, or they trust their doctors, won't necessarily say us, they trust their doctors as almost as much as they trust their friends and family. Their friends and family, who also tend to be conservative Republicans, tend not to know very much about global warming but their primary care doctors, or I think that is a proxy for their doctors in general, this is an incredible opportunity that they have to communicate the realities of climate change, the personal relevance of climate change to the group of Americans who are most important for us to reach more effectively than we have reached in the past. And all of this begins to, um, you know, confirm why I believe we have, we as health professionals have a completely unique role to play. We are trusted across, um, among people across the political continuum. We are especially trusted among the people who are most difficult to reach. And what is it that we can share with them? Well, we can share the fact that climate change is already harming the health of people in our nations through eight distinct pathways. Um, they are air pollution. The warming, warmer weather uh, exacerbates air pollution. Um, extreme heat events, heat kills. Extreme weather, extreme weather is, uh, is perhaps another way of saying violent, dangerous weather that, that injures and kills people. 
through three different forms of, of infectious disease, uh, vector-borne illness, waterborne illness, and foodborne illness. It also has an, it's harming our health by its impacts on our food, both the food that is grown and brought to the table, as well as the food that is destroyed in the process of being grown and harvested and brought to the table. Extreme weather is incredibly harmful to food systems because so many of our crops and livestock are damaged as a result of extreme weather events. And then finally, the mental health harms of climate change, which can be both direct people who are who have their home damaged, who must evacuate their community as a result of an extreme weather event, those people are very likely to suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. And for the rest of us who have been blessed by not experiencing that sort of event, many of us live with a dread of the future, with chronic anxiety, depression, as a result of knowing that unless we get this under control, our children our grandchildren and their children and grandchildren will be living much less healthy, much less secure, much less prosperous lives than we have been able to live. Oh, one last thought here. Just the, the first of those impacts through air pollution, it's already, uh, there are about uh, seven and a half million premature deaths from tobacco use worldwide every year. There are already more premature deaths from air pollution, burning fossil fuel, than from uh, tobacco use worldwide. In my 42 years in public health, I was trained to, to believe and have been reinforced to believe over that entire period that tobacco is public health enemy number one. But burning fossil fuels is already demonstrably a more power potent harm to human health and well-being than even tobacco use. We've conducted a lot of research on how to communicate what we know about the harms of human health, uh, the harms of global warming to human health. Um, in a study that we published in, in GeoHealth in 2018, it's referenced on this slide, we took those eight pathways, air pollution, extreme heat, extreme weather, et cetera. And for each of them, we wrote, we summarized the, the um, the epidemiologic findings. Actually, we summarized the National Climate Assessment's climate and health chapter, um, which is all based on epidemiologic studies and climate research. Um, and we described in, for each of those eight impacts in about 150 words, what's happening to our climate? How is that harming our health through air pollution, through extreme heat, through extreme weather, et cetera? And who is most likely to be harmed? It's a little, it differs a little bit from pathway to pathway, but in generally speaking, who's most likely to be harmed? Our babies, our children, pregnant women, uh, our seniors, people with chronic illness, people who earn their livelihoods outdoors, people in low income communities and communities of color. And when we had people read those eight, 150 word essays. We had them read, rate each essay on a variety of dimensions, including, is this information new to you? Is it information? Do you see it as personally relevant? Which allowed us to assess which of the eight brief essays was seen as most valuable to them. But after reading all eight of those brief essays, we went back and we asked them a series of questions, both immediately after reading the essays and again, two to three weeks later. And what we learned is that reading these eight 150 word essays, a very short amount of information, increased people's cognitive engagement in the issue, the degree to which they saw it as personally relevant, as well as their affective engagement in the issue, the degree to which they were worried about global warming. And true to my survey data that I showed you earlier a minute ago, the uh, people's cognitive and affective engagement was especially likely to increase among people in the middle and on the moderate conservative side of the political continuum. So this data begins to reinforce that uh, premise that I spoke about a moment ago, that we have a unique opportunity to help people who are resistant to thinking about climate change understand its personal relevance and therefore become more engaged in the issue. Oh, oh, and by the way, um, all, these essays are available to you in that um, what, what you see in the upper right is the cover of our medical alert report uh, produced by the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. So if you if you Google Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, you can find and download that medical alert report. 
Of course, the health harms of climate change is only half of the conversation, half of the necessary conversation. The other half is the profound benefits, the profound health benefits of implementing climate solutions. From a health perspective, those benefits that there are eight, there, excuse me, there are five policy solution pathways that if we take them, they are not only good for our climate, they are also good for our health. The use of clean renewable energy and reducing energy waste is the first. Um, favoring climate smart foods, i.e. foods down the, uh, down on the, uh, closer towards plants and further away from, uh, from animals. Um, those are climate smart foods and the degree to which we favor them and climate smart farms and food systems, it's good for our health, it's good for our climate. The third pathway is supporting clean and active transportation, something that we as health professionals are already doing, but climate uh, benefits give us yet another reason to do so. The fourth pathway is improvements that we can make to our buildings and our homes so that we're using less electricity, that we're we're less like we're putting less fossil fuel air pollution into our homes, for example, in the form of um, cooking using methane. And then finally, we can make improvements to our community environments by creating you developing green infrastructure that ultimately makes our communities not only nicer places to live, but also healthier places to live and more climate smart communities. The benefits of talking about these policy solution pathways is while the climate benefits of these pathways accrue over many decades, the health benefits accrue almost immediately. The climate benefits accrue a little bit worldwide. The community benefits, the, or the, the health benefits accrue in our community, in whatever community takes implements these solutions, these five policy pathway solutions. So by talking about the health benefits of climate actions, we're bringing the benefits home into people's present lives and we're bringing it into their communities, which is something that no other voice in the climate conversation can do nearly as effectively as we can. We've conducted research that shows that both talking about the health impacts and talking about the policy solutions have a profound impact on increasing people's likelihood to get involved in supporting collective action. And by collective action, I mean contacting their elected officials to advocate for smart climate and health policies. We've also learned that it's helpful to activate or affirm positive social norms, social norms that if you feel like you are alone, you're the only one who cares, it's not true. The most people care, but not enough of us are taking action. Or, and many of us are taking action. Either way that we've tested the affirmation of helpful social norms, it helps to activate people. Of these three types of information, the most important, the, most, the, the one that most reliably leads to activating people is the policy solution information, the focus on solutions. But all three of these types of information contribute to activating people, showing the health impacts, identifying helpful policy solutions, and affirming helpful social norms. And again, as with our prior research, this is equally true for conservatives as for liberals. One final element to what I call the climate and health narrative. And that final element is, well, if these things are so good, why haven't we done them already? That's a really reasonable question for people to ask, or at least to think about. And the answer is, we haven't done these things already because we have some very powerful opponents who do not want to see us implement smart public policies on, along these five policy solutions pathways that I talked about. So in our most recent research, which isn't yet published, but hopefully will soon be, we took the climate and health narrative, the, the explaining the human health impacts of climate change, explaining the human health benefits of climate solutions, affirming a positive social norm, and we tested that with and without directly calling out fossil fuel CEOs and their lobbyists, or some politicians, or fossil fuel CEOs and their lobbyists and the politicians who are in their back pockets. We literally added 
a, a very short paragraph that called out the opponents. And what we learned is that by adding this fourth element to the climate and health narrative, it, it, it uh, makes that narrative even more effective than not calling out the opponents. Some health professionals have told me they are uncomfortable doing that. They don't want to poke the bear. And that's okay. Anyone who doesn't want to point out the opposition because they are a powerful, well-organized opposition, you don't have to. But I want you all to know that if you're willing to do so, you will be more effective as a climate and health communicator, particularly with conservative people in your nation. So this is why I've concluded that we have a unique role to play because the climate health narrative makes the problem personal. It brings the benefits of solution into the present and into our communities, and it helps to depolarize the issue. It brings people in our communities who are at opposite ends of the political continuum. It helps them think in similar ways about the nature of our problem so that they can have an adult conversation about the solutions that they feel are going to be most appropriate. I want to leave you with two final very short ideas. The first one is I have started, some colleagues and I have started to call climate change as uh, to be an ecological determinant of health. In my 40 plus years as a public health professional, it, it, in the first decade or two, we didn't talk about social determinants of health because nobody was talking about them yet. Over the past two and a half decades, we've talked extensively about it, and we've done a very good job at refocusing our work in public health and in clinical health care on addressing the social determinants. But oh, now we must also address the ecological determinants of health. Because when we destabilize those ecological determinants of health, most fundamentally, a, climate, uh, a stable climate, we directly harm or undermine the social determinants of health. We also directly harm or undermine our healthcare delivery systems, especially in exactly the time when we most need them. During an extreme weather event, for example, when people are people are being harmed by the extreme weather. We need our healthcare delivery systems to be at peak operating efficiency. And yet that is exactly the time when they are most likely to be at diminished capacity because of the extreme weather. And, and finally, the ecological determinants of health, particularly a stable climate, have a profound impact, as I've talked about, on, on human health through all of those eight pathways that I previously mentioned. So final thought, this is how I have now come to think. This is how I am now reorganizing my work because I've recognized that our climate and our health share a common enemy. And that enemy is fossil fuels. So I am using my work to do everything possible to help my community, my nation, and all nations of the world decarbonize as rapidly as is possible because that is the most important contribution we can make to human health and well-being and to stabilizing our climate, thereby helping the world achieve its the goals established in the Paris Climate Agreement. So with that, if you would like to join my colleagues and I who work uh, as part of the Global Climate and Health Alliance, I would ask you to point your phone at that QR code. It will take you to a sign-up sheet where you can become a climate and health champion with those of us who are working under the umbrella of the Global Climate and Health Alliance. Peter, I turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Ed, for that uh, excellent presentation. It's, it's so important to uh, receive this information on the evidence base in terms of effective uh, climate change and health communication, which I think is what health decision makers really, really need. And it really sets the foundation, I think, for the, the other presentations that we're going to hear from the, the experts. So next, um, we'll hear from uh, Donna Atkinson and Roberta Stout. I understand that they weren't sure if they could be here with us um, in person. So we have a pre-recorded uh, presentation that we will now uh, hear. Are we able to load that? Uh, great, thanks, Ellie. Welcome to the Pan American Climate Resilient Health Systems course titled Climate Change and Indigenous People's Health in Canada. 
My name is Roberta Stout, and I'm Cree from the Cahuan First Nation in Alberta, and I live and work out of Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I'm really honored today to be presenting with Donna Atkinson. Welcome to the webinar, everyone. Uh, my name is Donna Atkinson. I'm the Research and Operations Manager at the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, and I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Clayton Tanae First Nation in Prince George, BC. So now that you know uh, where we are from, um, please take a moment to put whose traditional territory you are on in the chat. The NCCH is uh, one of six national collaborating centers for public health established in 2005 with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Each NCC is focused on a specific health topic, and our center is unique in that we are focused on the health of a population, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Our mandate is to strengthen public health and support health equity for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis through knowledge translation and exchange. Specifically, we work to translate new and existing research and Indigenous knowledges into useful and accessible formats. We work to identify knowledge gaps to encourage research and public health priority areas and support network development to facilitate knowledge exchange and mobilization across the public health system. We are hosted by the University of Northern British Columbia, which is that tiny little campus in the picture there. So how did we find ourselves here to present today? The NCCIH was invited by Health Canada back in 2018 to participate in the National Climate Change Health Assessment titled Health of Canadians in a Changing Climate, Advancing Our Knowledge for Action, which was released in February 2022. The assessment included 10 chapters, including health linkages, natural, resource, natural hazards, mental health and well-being, air quality, infectious diseases, water quality, quantity and security, food safety and security, health equity, adaptation and health system resilience, and for the first time, our chapter, chapter two, which focused specifically on First Nations, Inuit and Métis people's health and well-being in the context of a changing climate. Before we dig into that work, it's important to understand the populations we are talking about. Data from the 2021 census uh, indicates that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples in Canada are the most youthful and fastest growing segment of the population. They are increasingly urbanized, and uh, among and between First Nations, Inuit, Métis, there is an incredible amount of diversity in terms of language, knowledge, cultures, experiences, and constitutional rights. A caveat before we get into the content of our chapter is that it's not original research. It is a comprehensive literature review that includes peer review publications, great literature and alternative media sources with a focus for the most part on Canadian publications in the last 10 years. One of the biggest challenges for us in doing this work is that climate change research is constantly evolving and more importantly, we are health researchers and not climate scientists. The other challenge around identifying health risks specific to First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples is that in Canada, there are significant knowledge gaps in the research in terms of the populations and geography studied. To effectively communicate the climate change risks to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people's health, we needed to do a few things. The first is to focus on how health determinants and existing health in inequities can exacerbate climate change risks to health. We needed to look at the direct and indirect impacts of climate change on the land and on Indigenous peoples' relationships with the land. And to highlight the importance of Indigenous knowledges and rights in climate change research, mitigation and adaptation, and policy responses. And finally, to point out key knowledge gaps in the existing literature to inspire better research. We developed six key messages for the chapter that we will now take you through. We know that climate change will affect all Canadians, but the distribution of these impacts and the related health risks are not equal. We also know that although Indigenous or although First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people and Indigenous peoples globally contribute very little to greenhouse gas emissions, they are uniquely sensitive to the impacts of climate change because of their close relationships with 
and dependence on the land, waters, animals, plants, and natural resources for their sustenance, livelihoods, cultures, identities, health, and well-being. Uh, they also have a tendency to live in geographic areas already experiencing rapid climate change, especially northern Canada, and have a greater existing burden of health inequities compared to non-Indigenous populations in Canada, including higher rates of infant and child mortality, chronic and infectious diseases, exposure to environmental contaminants, unintentional injury, and re reduced life expectancy. Our second key message is that these health impacts are interconnected and far-reaching from increased food and water insecurity and infrastructure damage to threats to personal safety, physical health, and emotional, spiritual, psychological, and cultural well-being. These health impacts are already evident from coast to coast to coast, and much like the determinants of health, they are experienced differently within and between First Nations, Inuit, and Métis men, women, boys, girls, and gender diverse people. That means that climate change research, mitigation, adaptation, and uh, research must be respect to cultures, geography, local context, and the unique needs of these communities. So as part of the report, we included a table that's shown here, which provides a quick summary of some of the climate-related causes and potentially devastating health effects of climate change. And that um, table can be viewed fully in our chapter. So our fourth key message is that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples have been actively observing and adapting to changing environments in a diversity of ways since time immemorial. Indigenous knowledge systems and practices are equal to scientific knowledge and have been and continue to be critical to Indigenous people's survival and resilience. Our fifth key message is that Indigenous knowledge systems are increasingly recognized, both nationally and internationally, as important in adapting to climate change, to monitoring impacts at the local and regional level, and to informing climate change policy and research. That brings us to our last key message, which is that uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people are rights holders. Preparing for the health impacts of climate change requires that Indigenous people's rights and responsibilities over their lands, resources, and ways of life are respected, protected, and advanced through distinctions-based Indigenous-led climate change adaptation and policy. And policy. We know that Indigenous peoples and communities are the best suited to identify their exposures and vulnerabilities to climate change impacts, uh, the real and perceived impacts on their health, and suitable adaptation strategies. So very briefly, uh, these are some of the key knowledge gaps we identified in our work. So many are associated with limitations in Indigenous health data and research in Canada generally including a lack of disaggregated and longitudinal data and health indicators that is specific to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and a long history of unethical research practices that contributed to the misappropriation and abuse of Indigenous knowledges, property, and cultural and biological samples, and also a failure to share data and resulting benefits with communities. In terms of populations and geography study, we saw that most of the research is focused on Inuit populations in the Arctic, which is a global hotspot for climate change. However, as a result, First Nations communities outside of the North, especially communities in the prairies in the Atlantic provinces are underrepresented, as well as Métis peoples across Canada and urban Indigenous populations. Few studies looked at the intersection of climate change and gender, particularly the experience of gender diverse people, children and youth. There is a lack of literature on the holistic and long-term impacts of changing temperature and precipitation regimes on things such as food and water safety and security, air quality, health infrastructure, personal safety, mental health, and how these will impact livelihoods, identities, and cultures within and among these diverse populations. Few studies examined climate-related health impacts within the context of existing health inequalities and inequities and the determinants of health. Few studies looked at the resilience and protective factors related to climate change, and finally, there is limited research on the determinants of adaptive capacity or the effectiveness of community-based adaptation initiatives and how Indigenous knowledges have been used in adaptation initiatives. So our chapter was large and we covered a lot. And one thing we wanted to do to better communicate the content was to bring lived experiences and voices of Indigenous peoples 
uh, to the work. So we developed a series of podcasts, which can all be accessed on the NCCIH website uh, under Voices from the Field. And just to draw your attention to one podcast, in episode 17, we included a conversation with PhD candidate Spencer Greening of the Gitgat First Nation in British Columbia. As part of his research, he draws on teachings from the land to adapt to climate change including stories. He reminds us that we as human beings are part of the larger ecosystem and that we have much to learn from the teachings offered up by different species, spirits, and beings as we look for ways to adapt to a changing environment. We also did a series of webinars related to Indigenous peoples and climate change, such as uh, those focused on food safety and security, water safety and security, and First Nations leadership on climate change focused on the national and regional strategies of the Assembly of First Nations. We know that infographics are also an amazing tool to distill a lot of information into digestible resources. And so we did two such product, pro, sorry, products for sharing out including Indigenous Knowledges and Climate Change in Canada and Climate Change and Indigenous Peoples in Canada, the Health Impacts. And similarly, we know that not everyone has time to read through a long or technical report. Therefore, we developed short standalone fact sheets distilling information on specific health impacts and on Indigenous knowledges and rights. So some of the best practices we think are important in communicating climate change risks specific to Indigenous peoples are to make sure you understand and acknowledge the diversity of worldviews, perspective, and experiences of Indigenous peoples in your work, to try to communicate to a wide variety of audiences and sectors because addressing climate change is everyone's responsibility, from youth and communities right up to senior policymakers. Uh, use multiple formats to communicate your message, including some of those we've shown you today. And it's important to privilege Indigenous research that's that's led by First Nations Inuit Métis people and also to privilege lived experiences and voices and uh, most importantly focus on strength and innovation instead of deficits. Uh, so if you'd like to order the full report or any of the products we discussed in the webinar please feel free to contact the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health. All of our resources are free of charge and can also be downloaded. So with that, I'd like to thank Peter and the organizers for inviting us to participate today. And uh, we'll be um, joining later for the uh, question and answer session. So thank you very much. Well, that that was really great. Um, I, I actually had the priv privilege of working with uh, Donna and uh, Roberta on the National uh, Health Assessment, learning from from their activities, which is which is a really great experience. So now I'll call on uh, Carolina for her presentation um, to provide that to us now. Hola, buenos días con todos y con todas. Eh, un saludo. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from Ecuador and thank you for inviting me. Today, I've been asked to share with you my experience on the importance of educational communication to manage uh, disaster risk in the health area and in a context of climate change. I will be doing this as a member of the management unit uh, for risk disaster management in Ecuador and other countries in the region. First of all, I would like to talk about 
global health challenges as presented by the WHO in 2020. Then I will be making a presentation on what I think might be the main challenges of educational communication or edu communication when it comes to disaster risk reduction uh, in the context of climate change. In 2020, the WHO published a list of the uh, 13 main challenges when it comes to global health in this decade. Among them, we can find, first of all, um, health has to be addressed with climate change. Health should reach um, places of conflict and crisis. Um, medical care should be fair. I wish people should have access to medicines. Um, we should be ready to face new pandemics. We should ensure uh, healthy foods and products for everyone. We should invest in the people that defend on health. We should protect adolescents, use technologies positively. We should protect the medicines that protect us. We should uh, keep medical care clean and we should um, earn people's trust. We went over these challenges uh, compiled by the WHO. So I found that, that they could help me structure this presentation. Uh, mainly, I would like to address this final challenge that has to do with uh, gain people's trust. So the question that I ask myself is the following. What do we mean by gaining people's uh, trust? I think we should think about this challenge by considering the, the importance of gaining people's trust. And this is essential to reduce uh, disaster risk, especially in each of the key processes of disaster risk management. And this has to do with prevention, mitigation, and you know, uh, response readiness, also recovery and post-disaster recovery. We should also gain people's trust. And this is essential when it comes to taking adaptation uh, uh, measures when it, to face climate change in different contexts. Um, so gaining people's trust uh, requires tools and edu communication is or might be a potential, a powerful tool to gain people's trust. Edu communication as in education and communication is inherent to human nature. It entails the interaction and exchange of significant messages, also using uh, various channels and media, also influencing people's behavior on an individual and community level, and also within social systems, uh, informing the population, training the population, and this edgy communication understood as a dynamic intersectoral interinstitutional and interdisciplinary action it also has a huge uh, efficacy potential when it comes to uh, disaster risk reduction now i would like to focus on some of the main challenges i think that what uh, my colleagues have said is really interesting because, uh, for instance, they have talked about some of the topics that I would like to address as challenges. First of all, when it comes to uh, edgy communicating and, and, and risk prevention. During the pandemic, many people and communities rejected vaccines because of a lack of information. And this, or part of this has to do with how their own languages are used. We uh, 
made an effort throughout our continent, for instance, to um, edu communicate about the concepts of the pandemic with indigenous peoples and nationalities. This is an experience done by the Ministry of Public Health in collaboration with the WHO. And this was very successful. And we worked with the Confederation of Indigenous Nationals from Nationalities Peoples from the Amazon, including working with a foundation, the Raiz Foundation, that included surveys uh, that were done in indigenous languages. And this was so successful that we have started a national program to strengthen the, the capacities of the indigenous peoples of Ecuador. We have 28 different peoples and nationalities in our country. Uh, that are present throughout the national territory in the coastal region, in the center and in the Amazon. And this success uh, case not only included adapting these messages to the native languages, but also using technology to solve significant problems that these communities face. Other, another one of the challenges has to do with communicating based, um, in, in evidence-based information. In this slide, there's also, this is the title of a UNICEF effort that aimed at finding out key data for preparedness and for self-protection, um, but not just for the individual, but also the families, the households. And the organization um, itself, the WHO has already warned us of a phenomenon that is called infodemia that is the overexposure to information that can be both true or false and as the director of the organization has said is hindering the contention me measures causing panic and causing divisiveness this was um, in speaking in during the pandemic at a time where cooperation and solidarity from everyone was necessary to end the health crisis. There have been studies, for example, this is a study conducted in Brazil that reached the, con the conclusion that fake news spread in the first months of the pandemic, uh, characterized by political positionings, um, but, uh, false information about the number of deaths and the main channels used for spreading this information were social media, WhatsApp and Facebook and included uh, content such as text messages, but also videos uh, among others. One of the main challenges that we also have is how public health can be compromised by the erosion of the trust that people have in public institutions. Uh, in this slide, um, we have the, the title of a yellow alert in a small community in the province of Chimborazo in my country in February 2023. But however, because of trust in public institutions has been so badly eroded, the population uh, did not believe the, this alert and remained in location. Then there was a mudslide 
in uh, um, a month after the the yellow alert was was declared and in that disaster so far um, there have been 35 bodies recovered of, of people who have died but there's still 60 people who are still missing so the search um, and rescue efforts in this area are still ongoing even a month after the event if mistrust um, erodes the credibility of public institutions then the opposite trust helps in this case, uh, patients, people, communities um, be dependent on uh, public services and to follow the advice of um, professionals about the health risks. In my city uh, specifically, but in my country, I live in Guayaquil. We have high levels of poverty and structural inequality informal employment is the main feature in in our job market so during the pandemic the transmissions that ended up causing the lives of, of lots and lots of people within weeks and months and this was a case that that was shared throughout the world um, the the widespread transmission was caused because the people did not trust the information that they were receiving. And based on that mistrust, they not only put their own risk, their own health at risk, but also the health of the entire city and the entire country. There were numerous cases of uh, people who violated the mandatory confinement and mandatory distancing measures because the trust in public institutions was so eroded. And faced with all of that, it's fundamental that, that we share, uh, that we b build um, science uh, literacy and education for health. And about this, it's important it's important to work on this so that this literacy takes place uh, based on what we already discussed, science evidence, but it is also important for knowledge and science producers to listen more and more the communities that they are serving throughout this um, period. We have also seen that a lot of the information that has been in circulation has to do with um, an inaccurate management of, of the information of the data. Uh, so the, that also affects the production of knowledge. So as I show in this slide, knowledge and science need also to uh, self-reflect and, and fix the mistakes that, that have been made that can have a um, negative impact on the life um, on the lives of people and also ecosystems. And finally, in closing, I wanted to refer back to the first challenge that the WHO set for this decade. And the, this challenge has to do with putting the health on the debate, uh, understanding the climate crisis as a health crisis as well. And um, there, there's a piece of news in this slide, uh, a headline that mentions that a company such as Shell knew uh, for um, since 70 years ago about the climate impacts and they, that they had been warned and that they knew of the negative impacts of fossil fuels. 
So we need in this case, and I'm closing with this, we need edu communication to take into account the ethics of care. We need to be held accountable and we need to be responsible for the impacts of our actions. Bernardo Toro, a Colombian philosopher says that care is the central category of the new paradigm of civilization and that care takes a double function both in the prevention of future damages but also in the regeneration for the damage the past damages and he has a challenge that is either we care or we die so thank you um and i hope all of these reflections from someone who works on this community in health risk management and in recovery from those damages. I hope those reflections have resonated with you and will contribute to our efforts to use edu communication in the prevention of disaster risks, especially in healthcare services and in the current uh, climate change context. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for that excellent uh, presentation, uh, Caroline, and, and, and the reminder of how important uh, uh, trust and some of the other uh, concepts are that you shared with everybody. I know your messages uh, resonated with many participants uh, in the chat, so really appreciate your, your presentation today. And, and now it's, it's a really a great uh, pleasure to invite uh, Minister uh, Peve to, uh, to undertake her presentation for us uh, now. Minister? Bien. We can see it. Well. Ver? Buenos días, eh, a todos, Good a todos. morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here with my team to share with you some of the actions that we're working on in the province of Neuquén. First, I want to share that the Ministry of Health of our province has been working on the link between health and climate change for a few years. Our framework for all of these actions in the ministry is the Provincial Health Plan for 2019-2023. And we have an uh, something that cuts across all and we have this first axis that is integrated environmental health and well-being with a specific action item that is uh, regional health in the territory so we want to be present throughout the entire province working together with local communities because we understand that climate change and health needs to involve as many actors and stakeholders as possible. We recently extended the scope of this uh, to uh, include up to 2030, including health as an axis for all our political actions, including different perspectives that sometimes are outside of the specific scope of our ministry. So. We want to include this uh, principle of promoting promotion of health from all actions, because all actions of all ministries need to take into account the positive impact that their actions can have on the health of the community. And something also in relation to climate change is the concept of One Health that establishes that the health of humans is closely connected to the health of the environment and animals, and that there needs to be a comprehensive and interdisciplinary perspective to address this. And this 
together with the work with the communities has led our work in the, in the link between climate and health. We work with this uh, program uh, that uh, for healthy uh, municipalities with some common approaches for the climate crisis. And we shared the vision uh, for a promotion of health and one health. And we always include the environmental health in the agenda of all municipalities with an intersectoral perspective as well. Uh, we work strengthening the capacities of municipalities and local commissions for um, to, to work on poli um, policies that are um, comprehensive and working both with um, the local at the local level and provincial level, sharing good practices, always with the focus on primary health care as a strategy to organize the, the provincial healthcare system. As for the actions that have been conducted, I'm going to go into some examples. We, based on that concept definitions that I shared at the beginning, um, well, the healthcare system in our province has um, uh, um, we have uh, in increasing at different levels of care, and this hospital um, aims at uh, solving our problems within the province, so that we don't have to at the local level, so that we don't need to move patients hundreds of kilometers away. We are working uh, already on this hospital that is going to have a surface a total of 42,000 square meters. And this building was planned as a sustainable building from the beginning and building that will reduce the negative impact on the environment based on the construction message here. So we planned on using renewable energy sources with energy efficiency standards and passive design that also makes a rational use of water and reuses water and a rational use of energy as well. Uh, to reduce water risks and uh, heat island uh, effects. We have also worked on the area where the Ministry of, of Health has its uh, building. We have two big buildings and it's a, a, a whole area with government building where approximately 2000 people work. So we have conducted some actions to reduce um, energy use, to reduce emissions, to work on waste management as well, to create awareness as well with, uh, with our workers about the importance of the use of resources such as water, energy, and reusing materials and adequately managing waste. Another action that we that is ongoing because it involves progressively adapting the our infrastructure is the adaptation of sustainable green health centers. Uh, we have a policy that uh, is based on proximity with the community and this is uh, done through facilities that are distributed throughout the territory. So our policy consists of uh, prioritizing the role of these infrastructure centers and making, um, including passive design, including uh, local um, species of vegetation using sensors 
for say water conservation, increasing the ability to solve problems locally, and also working on the connection between the healthcare team and the community. Aside from adaptation and mitigation actions, we are also working on spaces that will enable us to implement all of this at the institutional level. This is one of the three provinces include, included in the readiness project that is coordinated by the Ministry of Health of the country and the president's office for cooperation, the WHO, with funding from the Green Climate Fund. For the first time worldwide, they are providing funds to a health and climate change project. This project aims to create a health system that is low in GHG emissions. This is done by several ministers and, and it is monitored and coordinated as well. And we also build the necessary technical capacities. Also at the Ministry of Health, we created an, a health and climate change panel, including more over 10 areas from the Ministry of Health, because we want to have a diverse and interdisciplinary perspective to address these health issues caused by climate change. Also, this panel complements the proposals of the uh, uh, Health uh, and Climate Change Action Plan. It also contributes to developing and sustaining a policy that considers the associated health risks. Also in March 23, we organized our regional training workshop. This was Climate, the Environment and Health of the Americas. We had the participation of PAHO, the IAI and the Bellman Forum. These actions have included a brand redesign. So we have unified every action. We also have press management in the uh, province and we focus on health and climate change. Also, our communication actions are cross-cutting because this is essential in our policies. This is why we have the communications area as a participant in the ministerial panel. There's still a long way to go when it comes to, co to communication. We need to focus on communication strategies that uh, are coordinated with our provincial policies, but that also include the actions taken as part of a, uh, in an initiative led by the Ministry of Health. Uh, our speakers, the speakers again before me also addressed these issues. So this shows the importance of the topic. Challenges. There are several challenges. Um, this topic is now clearly included, included in the political agenda. And a great challenge is to show uh, to make this topic visible. And as I was saying, advancing towards one health as a, a guiding principle. Also with, a, with climate change, this must be one of the main variables when it comes to implementing and evaluating public policies. This will also bring us closer to this major concept of one health. Climate change manifests in, uh, unequally in different territories. Therefore, one another main challenge is to keep working with local governments in order to support municipalities and uh, localities so that they can have their own climate change action plans. We're also working on a major challenge, sustainable purchasing. This is a, a government-wide initiative, and we would like to implement this uh, at the Ministry of Health. We want to have local and sustainable suppliers. And now we have a, a green, uh, a directory of green purchases. 
We also need to continue reducing our carbon footprint by using alternative energies in every hospital and health center in the province. Regarding communications, and I think this is all part of the of this initiative, there are other challenges as well. Just a few of them. First of all, we need to make a growing effort to simplify messages, health science messages. We need to simplify them and convey them in a simple way. We should try to humanize the effects of climate change so that people can relate to all this. We should also further showcase specific actions taken by the government and also what uh, citizens can do in their everyday life. Climate crisis affects us all equally, so we need everyone to do their, their best to change our behavior. This is a complex job that needs to be led by communication. A further challenge, continue training healthcare workers on climate change risks and how we should face them. In this sense, we need to create consultation tools so that we can evaluate our basic knowledge on the topic and its implementation. Finally, I would like to remember that changing that habit changing is important to us all. It includes our everyday actions. And from the states and uh, provinces and regions, we need to sh show that we are changing our attitude when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to adaptation and mitigation to lead transformation. Effective communication is essential in order to mobilize collective action and create a real change when it comes to shared accountability, something that we really learned about during the pandemic. Thank you very much for this invitation once again. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation. There's, there's so much that your ministry is doing that I think uh, all health uh, decision makers can really benefit uh, uh, from. Uh, I really liked uh, all of the actions uh, on sort of the, both the mitigation component in the health system and the resiliency building component as well. That's a big challenge to bring both those together. And, and, and also your discussion of the importance of, of uh, challenges that others are facing as well. So thank you so much for that uh, presentation. I, I see that uh, we're ending uh, or we're, we're nearing the end of the uh, of the session. I just want to thank all of our expert uh, presenters today for these uh, really insightful presentations. And I'll now invite uh, Dr. Cecilia Sorensen, the um, uh, director of the Global uh, Consortium on uh, Climate and Health Education, uh, to close the session, but also the uh, the course. As this is the last uh, the last session, uh, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry, and um, echoing your sentiments. What an incredible um, session we had today. Thank you for all of our speakers. I can't believe it, but we've actually come to the end of the Pan American Climate Resilient Health Systems course. But as this course ends, we know that our work has really just begun. I'd like to take this opportunity to express huge thanks to all of our participants. As you can see in this map, we had representation from almost every single country in the Americas and further had colleagues joining us globally from Europe, from Africa, from Australia, from Southeast Asia. We are so grateful for your dedication um, to this issue. And we hope this course has equipped you to work in earnest in your regions to increase health system resilience in the face of climate change. We would also like to express a huge thanks to our- Sorry, incredible Cecilia, I, I don't wanna cut you off, but you're not sharing screen. I'm not, oh my gosh. No. Thank you. <laughs> Hold on, let me fix that. I had a really great map that everybody needs to see. Hold on here. Let's try that. How are we doing there? No, it's up. Okay, here's this map I was talking about. So we had incredible representation from almost every country in the Americas as well as colleagues joining us globally here. So thank you all so much for being here. I'd also like to express a huge thanks to our course faculty, um, our expert speakers who shared their time, their knowledge and their experience to really make this course um, so robust. So thank you all so much. 
And of course, a huge thanks to our incredible working group. Um, we all have been working tirelessly in planning and moderating these sessions. And we truly have an incredible collaboration here between the IAI, PAHO, Health Canada, and the GCCHE. So thank you so much to our working group. And of course, an enormous thanks to our interpretation team, um, to Lourdes, Anna, Annie, and Franz. You guys are incredible. I don't know how you do it. You have so much endurance and thank you for making this course um, really possible for us. So as you uh, all know, there is a certificate um, being offered for this course. So I'd like to just take a moment to share some details in terms of how you can obtain the certificate. Um, the criteria to have the, to get the certificate is that you must have attended at least six sessions and we record your attendance automatically when you log into Zoom. Um, the second criteria is to pass a brief exam. Um, the exam will actually be emailed out later today. There will be a link and you will have until May 4th at midnight Eastern time to complete the exam. So please check your emails for the link. We're also very interested in hearing your feedback about this course. So we ask you to please complete this brief survey. Um, Cam uh, Haley Campbell's putting a link in the chat right now where you can access the survey. There's also this QR code here where you can scan um, your feedback. Feedback really helps us design future courses, um, helps us improve things and make sure that these courses are really meeting your needs. So um, it's a really quick survey, probably takes three to five minutes. So please uh, um, let us know what you think and how we can do better next time. And as I mentioned, you know, this course is really just the beginning of our work together. And so I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to invite everyone here to join the Global, Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. Um, so you can receive further communications regarding our educational opportunities, such as courses like these. Um, there's a link in the chat available right now, and you can join as an individual, as an academic institution, as an organization, um, as a student, or as an individual. And so just a little bit of background on our organization, the mission of the Global Consortium is to ensure that 100% of health professionals globally have the knowledge and skills to recognize, respond to, and prevent health impacts of climate change. And so we obtain commitments from health professional training institutions to educate their students in climate and health. And we now have over 300 institutions in more than 50 countries. And our current pledges are reaching over 200,000 students annually. So if you are at an academic institution which trains any type of health professional. We'd love to have you join. And of course, we also have individual membership options available. And we work with many um, different groups around the world um, to improve education, to build resilience, to increase capacity. And so we'd love to have your organization join us. So with that, again, a huge thanks to everyone here, um, to our planning committee, to our speakers, and most of all, to you as participants. We hope this course has really equipped you to take this work forward, and we look forward to seeing you soon at our upcoming courses and events. So have a great day. Take care.